All right, this is the how to study more effectively PowerPoint presentation. I've been doing this for the last few years with all of the paramedic courses, and uh, I actually do it with the EMT courses when I'm in charge of them too. I think it's uh, pretty helpful to hear from me and maybe from the fellow students uh, some points of uh, how to study. Some uh, things that I start off with almost all of the time, and we've already talked about this a little bit in orientation, is you have to stay caught up. It's not important just because of grades, but it's important because of the way that our schedule goes. Um, here at the second part, you'll see their online lectures and quizzes help prime the student. Uh, you will see er early on in my lectures, I don't like to talk about stuff that I think that you should already know stuff that should be easy enough to pick up from just clicking through the lecture or reading through the book, watching the YouTube videos, all of those prime you. Uh, and when I'm talking, I'll, I'll expect you to know that information. You're not going to hear me talk much about basic airways, um, about the different levels of licensure and so many other things that I just expect you to know. Uh, we will be talking about those things maybe uh, after we take a quiz. Um, and during the review of a quiz. Uh, for, for my idea of how much time you should be spending outside of class, it's about a one for out, one. For one. Um, every, we're going to spend about eight hours in class. Um, I would expect that you're going to be spending about eight hours outside of class. Um, that's not including that clinical time. However, I would implore you to do as many clinical hours as possible. If you have that extra time because you may be young and living at home still, uh, that time is well spent. Find a couple of uh, paramedics that you like to work with or maybe an ER that you like to hang out in and spend some extra time there. And uh, that experience for us adults is going to be very full. So here's a pretty good uh, question. Uh, seemingly it would have an easy answer, but how do you read a textbook? And something that uh, a lot of people haven't been told is how to read a textbook. A textbook is a reference manual and you're not supposed to read it like a novel. All right. This is your reference manual. A great way to go through this class is to just start out with every chapter by clicking through the lecture. All right. Click through the lecture, answer the quizzes, questions at the end of that lecture. While you're clicking through that lecture, have pencil and paper paper ready for you to take a little bit of notes to say, I do or don't know this information. And then when you, uh, then you might want to open up your book. I would uh, suggest that you get a regular book. You can get the last, um, the last edition of this book on Amazon. So that's the seventh edition. Um, and it should be pretty much the same. When I refer to you to different, um, page numbers, I'll just be off by a few, not really that much, pretty much the whole time. Uh, some of the ACLS information has changed. Um, there's probably a little bit different emphasis when we get to bleeding control, but otherwise it's about the same textbook. So if you want to save yourself some money, that's one way. Um, you can also just use the ebook if you like, and um, you're ready to do that. I think that that's fine. But when you are looking at your textbook, what you want to do is open up the chapter and look at that first page where it has a bunch of the objectives. And then you've already been through the lecture, you've already answered some questions, and now just look at those objectives and ask yourself, do you know that content or not? Um, if you are reading an objective um, and you have no idea what it's talking about, then you should put um, maybe an empty box, just a small little empty box next to that number. Um, if you do know the objective, just put an X next to that objective and uh, pretend that you uh, know that material. Just say that to yourself. I know that material. Um, so I don't have to go look for that material. But where the empty box is, um, right in that same little area where the objective is, it'll tell you the page number where that information is. And so uh, that uh, is where you should go look. All right. So uh, what do you need to know and what don't you need to know? And then we all seemingly live busy lives. And so uh, only go and look at the stuff that you need to go look at. All right. Um, 
and then just skip the other stuff. There, there's some chapters that I'm going to say that you shouldn't do that. You know, the airway chapter, the respiratory chapter, maybe the cardiology chapter. There's a few. Um, but these first seven chapters are so... A lot of that, I think, after clicking through the lecture and reading through those objectives, you'll see that most of those objectives you know, uh, maybe towards the end where they're talking about QA or research, you might want to go look at that uh, and read through that a little bit better. But don't put an X there until you know the objective. And then when you know an objective, put an X there. So you had an empty box, now it's an X in the box. Um, maybe some question marks if you if you still don't understand it some question marks and then in your notes write hey ask Steve a question about this bring that up in class email me something like that um, that is how you use your textbook and that means when you're done you will not have read all your textbook and that is fine all right it is a reference manual it's not a novel so uh, use it as a reference manual uh, Authors will put in a lot of their extra stuff, a lot of extra pictures, graphs, all kinds of stuff. And if you don't learn well from those, those are just a waste of your time. Learn from reading the objectives and figuring out do you know those objectives or not. All of my quiz questions and absolutely every one of my test questions come from an objective. I don't ask any questions that can't be directly tied to one of those objectives. So a lot of the material in the book, I shouldn't say a lot, but quite a bit of the material in your book isn't associated with an objective. It's extra reading. All right. So uh, you don't need to know that. You, The National Registry is the same way. Everything is tied to an objective. So uh, some habits is uh, try not to study too much at one time. For me, it's probably around 40 to 50 minutes, uh, especially if I'm reading. Um, th that's about it. After 40 or 50 minutes, I will do something else, all right? No longer reading. It could be watching a YouTube over the, the same content, but it is definitely doing something else. And that might be uh, making a phone call, watching a short uh, YouTube video that has nothing to do with EMS, making a phone call, texting, whatever it would be. Something besides studying. Your mind is only going to take so much. Um, and a lot of times, again, if you remember, and I'm going to use this term a lot in the next few weeks, I'm training your brain. And a brain does not uh, continue to uh, store stuff into long-term storage when you're sick of studying. If you're sick of studying, don't study anymore. <laughs> it's time to stop. And just give yourself a little break. And hopefully, you're, you have that self-motivation to get back into it in a little bit. So some things are specific times for studying. For me, I can study in the morning. For you, you might not be able to. Um, you might be able to study well at night before going to bed. That's another pretty good time for me. Um, but try to schedule that and then try to study during that time. And then same times each day, each day of the week, whatever it would be. Your study should be planned, all right? Um, and when you have that plan, you go study, all right? Uh, again, I'll emphasize this, don't study if you don't want to study, all right? The way that your brain works is um, you will think that you're studying and doing good things and you won't be. You'll be wasting your time and it'll just lead to some frustration. Um, that's one of those, uh, you know, it's why I'm going to tell you to tell your friends and family, don't bother me during this time. <laughs> Please respect that I need to be concentrating on my paramedic studies. All right, so study for short increments, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes is, I think, about the max. And some of uh, you guys may be geniuses and study for longer than that, um, but others will be wasting their time. Um, here is the old picture of the brain, all right? And so we'll get fairly used to this. And what I'm going to be talking about is the limbic system. And the limbic system is often associated with, um, uh, like, a lot of times when people think limbic system, they think of the um, satiated feeling and things of that sort. Um, I'm going to go a little bit further in the whole limbic system. The first thing that we'll talk about is the amygdala. Um, and that amygdala is uh, usually called the fear center. All right. That's primal. We ha all have that. We're born with that. That's when uh, 
we hear a dog growl in a way that it sounds like it's going to bite us, we don't have to be taught that that's um, something that we should be afraid of. That is the amygdala that says, boom, here you go, here's your fear center. The, um, and so that's very often, uh, I don't think, I don't like to call it this, but um, it's sometimes called your rage center, your center for rage. So um, it is definitely the alert system. The next one, and when, when you're talking about limbic, uh, I didn't finish my thought there. Think behave, think emotion, all right? Emotion. Uh, goes with the limbic system. And it's not just that feeling of satiation. It can be that rage center also. But um, the amygdala, I like to think of it as that primal center in our body that gives us um, that automatic uh, dump of adrenaline and uh, tells us that uh, we should be, you know, our fear center should be engaged. The hippocampus is next. And the hippocampus, um, just underneath the hypothalamus is an area where um, our body will basically be saying, and this is an important part here, so if you weren't talk, weren't listening to me, now listen. The hippocampus is uh, an area where we could uh, associate it with a hypothalamus, and it is like the switchboard. A lot of times hypothalamus and to me the switchboard go together. The hippocampus will say, all right, this information is going to go here in the brain. This information is going to go there in the brain. And we have two different areas um, that when we're studying, we have to be cognizant of. We have a short-term memory area. Um, short-term memory is not the area where we want to store information that we'll want to recall later on a quiz. Rather, we want that to go into long-term memory. Long-term memory is in the temporal lobe of our brain. The other one is the frontal lobe of our brain. So remember when I was saying, try to learn this information like you're gonna teach it to someone else. That is one way that engages those pathways that allows you to store stuff in the right part of your brain, in the temporal lobe. So the hypothalamus then, again, Put those three words together amygdala hippocampus hypothalamus all of that is part of the limbic system um the hypothalamus we'll later talk about it always as the switchboard and the temperature regulation center it also has a lot to do with the endocrine system so something you'll hear me say over and over again uh while we're doing uh you know studying while we're talking about getting ready for tests while we're talking about taking tests and when we're talking about shock i will say adrenaline makes you stupid all right adrenaline is supposed to make you stupid that it is part of it all right it, uh, you're not supposed to be thinking logically when you're in the fight for your life all right when you have to outrun that bear whatever it would be logic goes out the window and you become that primal creature so um, this has two big implications. One is if you are in a bad mood, when you have what we would call sympathetic tone, we have a little bit more adrenaline in our system, not a whole adrenaline dump, just more adrenaline because we're frustrated, we're having a bad day, we want to go do something else, and we're stuck studying. When you're in that mood, when you start studying, your logic isn't going to be engaged. And those pathways are going to push everything to short-term memory and you will have wasted your time. So go have fun, all right? Go do something else and study when you're in the mood uh, to study. Another thing is when you're taking a test, be careful of adrenaline. Um, if you find that you have test-taking anxiety, if you've ever said to yourself, wow, I know the answer to that question, why did I answer that incorrectly? a lot of times, I'll call it maybe the number one culprit, is you let adrenaline flood your system a little bit. It doesn't mean that you got pale and sweaty and tachycardic with a high blood pressure and you, everything was going bonkers in your brain. It doesn't have to be that. It just has to be a sympathetic tone. The sympathetic nervous system took control of your body for a little while. And when that happens, you get a little bit of adrenaline and you get dumb. You stop making calculated um, uh, answers to different questions. You start skipping the things that you would normally do while you're um, uh, 
carefully and logically going through a test. So be careful of adrenaline. Check your pulse. Check your respirations. And I'll give you some uh, advice on how to bring those um, two parameters back down to normal. Study habits for successful students. These are things that I do and things that my students have said, hey, this helps, all right? One thing that I'll tell you, if you haven't figured it out yet, is YouTube is awesome. Whether it's uh, Dr. John Campbell, who's a nurse, it, the doctor is, uh, I think, a PhD in, in education, but it might be in pharmacology. But he's an uh, a educational doctor, not a uh, medical doctor. Um, he does stuff. Uh, you guys, I'm sure, have heard of the Khan Academy. All kinds of stuff. All you have to do is put in like respiratory and par paramedic, all right? Asthma, whatever you want to learn, it's on on um, YouTube. I'll be uh, sending you YouTube videos, uh, but you guys can find these and you guys will find awesome ones, all right? Uh, and uh, share them with each other. Uh, review your notes. Uh, take notes in class. Uh, scribble them out. Don't try and take pretty notes in class. Um, you can uh, take them as associated with the PowerPoints that I might use, but uh, review those notes, um, I'll say, before uh, beginning the class and after the class. So while you're studying, um, uh, eliminate distractions. Again, good communication with friends and family. Um, call another student, make some friends in class uh, and uh, work with them. And again, you can challenge each other to teach each other. And uh, it is one of those things where for me, especially if I have someone to work out with, I'm gonna work out more consistently. Uh, review your schoolwork sometime on the weekend. Uh, and if that doesn't work, maybe some other day. But uh, for me, it works because I usually try to relax on weekends, just take an hour to two hours at least and say, boom, I'm gonna do schoolwork. Review what I've done, get ready for the next week put my thinking cap on basically um, and make sure I'm good to go for the week. That's my that's my Sunday night thing. All right. And then use more than one textbook. Google um, or go to Amazon or wherever you like and uh, try and figure out a, a, a different paramedic text altogether. An older one that's made by Brady. Ask old you know friends that might have one. Brady has two. One is called the Essentials of Paramedic Care. And uh, the other one is like a five or at some point it was a seven volume uh, series. And that one was, I think, just called Paramedic Care. And sometimes you see it will call, it'll be called Principles and Practices of Paramedic Care. Um, there's a lot of older books that are really cheap on Amazon now. Just get one of those and then hit that, hit the same kind of chapters. And some of the information will be a little worrisome. And that's the ACLS stuff, some of the bleeding stuff, cause that's changed recently. But most of it is just taught in a different way. Um, I think the Brady book that's written by a, a author named Mistovich, he writes really well. Um, and, and that might be helpful. Ours is good, all right? Um, but if you um, are struggling with the reading, uh, a different one might be helpful. Tr truthfully, if you still have your EMT book, going back and getting a foundation and then adding to that from the paramedic also works. Um, and that's it. That's kind of a, an advanced uh, one though, that getting an, an extra book. Uh, some extra books might be pharmacology and uh, the 12 lead ECG, uh, any, any of those on 12 lead ECGs. And then, um, uh, find out where you're going to be able to study. Where is a good place for you to study? Um, and I don't mind where it is. I like coffee shops, but I also like bars. All right. So find a place where the, it, it really depends on your personality of um, how much busyness is going to be happening around you. Some of us will like it. Um, I don't mind it. And then uh, some of us want it to be super quiet and nobody around. And then just find that place for you you're a happy place basically. Um, so hopefully free from interruptions and distractions if that's what you need. And then have a bunch of material on hand. So for me, I figured this out a while, um, as I need more than just a bar top, I like to, I need a full table so I can have one or two books setting out along with my laptop, along with another area for, for notes. And I can refer to stuff back and forth very easy and add to notes then. So, uh, and be comfortable when you're doing that. So that might be a comfortable chair. So uh, 
taking notes. It's a good um, study technique to start with good note-taking habits, all right? Um, so if you I don't believe that you're good at this, uh, you can be. It's just more work for some people. Um, the first off is be ready to take good notes when you're get, getting to class, all right? And that might be reviewing notes from previous stuff looking at PowerPoints. If you need to, a lot of people like this, print off those PowerPoints that you'll be able to, that I'll send you or that will be on the, the uh, JB Learning site. And then you can have a little notes section for that. Um, stay with the course. So when I'm talking, it's not all new material. You won't know what to take notes on. You'll be way overwhelmed. Um, listen to me. If I'm, I will focus on the stuff that is super important. Uh, of course, you're going to bring the material, and that material will probably be highlighters, pencils, pens of different colors, whatever it would be. Um, so focus on what I'm saying. Uh, I will help you figure out what is important and what is not important. Uh, I'll do that with signal statements, but I'm not tricky with it. I'll basically say, this is important. If you weren't listening yet, listen now, things of that sort. Um, abbreviate as much as possible. Put question marks where you where uh, is not making sense, uh, and then later on you'll go in and uh, rewrite all of those things. All right, with complete words, with different colors, with very nice, neat lines, all of that stuff, and then maybe Google pictures and add that to your notes. I would suggest that everybody get like a three ring binder. I have extras here. If you need, I can give you a three ring binder and then be able to easily put in and take out a uh, notebook paper. And then um, I'll give you stuff and you can throw in handouts and throw in the quizzes, throw in all of the stuff that I'll give you on each of the medications. All of that kind of stuff um, will go into your binder. And uh, people who do this usually have at least um, at least one three inch binder when they're done and that will be golden for not only all the way up to your national registry and studying but then it's great when you're a paramedic too and to be able to go back and look at notes and say boom i just ran a stroke and this is how i learned stroke and it all makes sense now so keep it and then uh ems training is different from regular training all right this is not college um, as far as I'm concerned, this is more difficult than your normal college course, and it has to be that way. It's that important, all right? The uh, normal for college education is they try to teach it in a way that you'll be at what Bloom's level it would be called a application level. But then when they test you, they test you at a comprehension level. So you have big quiz, or I should say big exams at the end, and very often those questions, although there's a lot of them, those questions are written at a comprehension level. This is especially true in high school. For us, we will have to ask you questions at the application and analysis level, um, and that's where the National Registry is. The number one reason that the National Registry says that some programs have poor pass rates is because their exams are written at the comprehension level, which is normal for higher education, but it's not normal for us. It's not normal for uh, EMT and paramedic education. We have to know the information, not at a comprehension level, but we need to be able to apply what we know by running calls. We need to be able to make analysis uh, decisions, which is basically comparing and contrasting good treatment plans to figure out what we need to do for patients. So here are some study tricks um, and ways that I'm going to help you. Uh, one is I'm going to give you some acronyms. All right. Those I think are important and I feel like it's part of my job to help you and we're going to create some as students. Uh, some stuff is good with flashcards. All right. Uh, I like those for the medica medications because we need to have uh, immediate recall for some information. That's what I think flashcards are good for. So I'll tell you what flashcards card are good for and what they're not good for. Um, study groups is a great idea 
uh, and that can be a group of two, but man, uh, I see that all kinds of really, really good examples of when students created a group and then they studied together. Um, it pushes uh, each in individual in the group to study, and a lot of times uh, some of the higher performers in that group will learn the stuff better because they're teaching it. And uh, I know for a fact, probably every class, I don't know if I could come up with an example in every class, but where students helped each other and that was the difference that made it for this student all right students who were in groups uh you know ended up passing the course um, and you guys are going to help each other do that and then teach the material i'll say that several times but if you can teach this material you're going to learn it at a, at a better but um you can if you like uh i can send you this whole thing and you can uh, click through it I think you, this, you're going to get this as an mp4 file. So um, that is a TED Talk. Uh, let's go back a second and see um, if... Oh, it's not going to allow me to. Um, it, you, I'll send you the whole PowerPoint, and then you can go see her if you like. But that woman did a bunch of research on um, just... A, um, stature or the way she would stand and that would be it it wasn't her standing but they at a college level took a bunch of volunteers and said stand like this and they called it the Superman pose uh, with chest out fists on your uh, hips basically like Superman uh, with a cape flowing and then uh, she ended up changing that because she's not the only one who did the research she changed it to the Wonder Woman stance um, multiple research cases uh, just making that stance that was it changed hormone levels in people's all right so it changed the amount of now I'm not gonna be able to think of the, the hormone uh, cortisol it changed the amount of cortisol and testosterone and estrogen in uh, male and female subjects just standing that way and that was it without being told much more than we're gonna have we're gonna draw your blood we're gonna have you stand this way for a little while and we're gonna draw your blood again um that's it uh that changed um people's hormone levels if you're gonna change hormone levels and as we hopefully we understand adrenaline makes you stupid i think that cortisol and the others would have the potential of doing the same thing um so what you want to do is give yourself some positive self-talk um and a big thing that we'll talk about as running as as paramedics is we also have to fake it until we make it and that means when we're going into a medical call and it seems like uh somebody is really in uh a, a really sick maybe you might say a critical patient um things can our heart is going to be beating pretty fast and we'll be nervous but we absolutely can't look that way we have to look confident and uh like we know what we're doing and we've done this before and this last thing is arousal control and for arousal control um that is box breathing and this one i want you to practice too and then i'm going to finish this off um box breathing if you haven't heard this this is a uh, you know, and I wouldn't even call it an extreme athlete thing. It's again goes back to uh, Navy SEALs, but it is something that they teach all over the place, you know, high school football. So uh, box breathing, one thing that I, I, I've had a lot of conversations about this, and I don't think box breathing is to be done at the end of a workout or after the end of the after end of a run. Box breathing is all about arousal control. That's what I put those two together, arousal control and box breathing. So box breathing is the idea of, um, this is your box, if you can uh, imagine it, you're gonna have uh, a four second side for each side of your box. And uh, if you want, uh, you can download an app, I think for both the uh, Apple and um, Android, you can get a box breathing app. And I would like you to start practicing four second. Um, if you have to, you can do three second, but uh, if you practice this for a little while, you can easily do five second box breathing. 
which almost seems impossible, but it really isn't that big of a deal. So box breathing, here you go. For four seconds, what you'll do is you'll inhale. And that's a deep, long inhale for four seconds. So you have to practice for a little bit because usually we are only going to uh, inhale over a minute, a second and a half or two seconds. All right. So a longer drawn out four seconds of inhalation. And then you're going to hold your breath for four seconds. One, two, three, four. And then you're going to breathe out for four seconds. One, two, three, four. And then you're going to not breathe for four seconds. One, two, three, four. And you'll go back. And this is a little hard at first. Breathe in over four seconds, all right? So if you're able to do that for a minute or two minutes, uh, your pulse rate will go down. You will feel more at ease. Your blood pressure goes down. You'll have less adrenaline. Your parasympathetic nervous system starts to take over. It is amazing. All you have to do is practice it a few times. And it is a way to relax all right and if you're having a hard time with taking a test um and this is all over the place this is on your way to a call when you're in your clinicals or when you're a brand new going through your field training program practice uh, box breathing all right so you'll be box breathing positive self-talk and mental rehearsal as you're going through the um you know getting into the car that's in a car accident or going through the doorway approaching your patient all of those things will get you ready to um to do really good work so that is it um there's a there is about 10 more slides in this uh, slide presentation i'm going to i'm going to end it now and then uh and get rid of the other slides so uh that is it um uh, give me some feedback how you like this if you have some other ideas like hey you should add this to your uh, how to be successful presentation i would really appreciate any feedback that you have thanks a bunch